right today, I'm going to lecture on the ECG, and uh, we'll do the dissection lab today. This is for Wednesday's lab. So. ECG is electrocardiogram for short, but I never write it out. Most people already know that, actually. But what it represents is a composite of all ash potentials generated by all cells of the heart, autorhythmic and contractile. But it's not a single ash potential. That's what you'll learn in 430. But that's of a single cell. This is all the, this is the entire organ of the heart's electrical activity. of the entire heart can be observed by the ECG trace. Now what you can't see are the anatomical structures inside the heart that spread the electrical signal throughout the whole heart to make it contract. So when you study pictures like this, I would do a simple rendition of it. Four-chambered heart here. The heart beat starts in the little node of cells that have pacemaker potential up there in the right atrium. That is the SA node, which stands for sinoatrial node. I just always call it the SA node. We call it your number one pacemaker. Because your heart rate has a pace, and it's established by these special cells in these tiny little nodes. So any cell that has a pacemaker potential Cells have pace maker potential, like action potential. A pacemaker potential means these cells can self-generate APs or action potentials. Can self-generate APs, action potentials. Um, and actually, so this number one pacemaker, your SA node, number one. It's the strongest one. That's why it's number one. What does the SA stand for? Sinoatrial. And the sinoatrial node can generate uh, 80 to 100 action potentials per minute. Now from there, the signal spreads through all the atria through um, what are called internodal pathways. They have no pacemaker potential, they're just pathways for the depolarization to spread to a single point. They call it internodal pathways because they're between two nodes, the SA node and the AV node. Atrial ventricular node, or AV for short. It's your number two pacemaker. Are singular, see this dot? Is that the right or the left? Right, right. right atrium. What about there? Right. Yeah, so these aren't on both sides, they're only on the, the, these specific locations. Yeah. And this AV node is your number two pacemaker. It can only generate maybe 40 to 60 action potentials per minute. Now, this rate of action potentials are, are important. We're talking about your heart rate. Whatever your average heart rate is, it's established by your number one pacemaker. You only use your number two pacemaker if something's wrong with your number one pacemaker. Okay. So your, your average resting heart rate, about 75 beats per minute, it's slower than what this is capable of doing. 
So that tells you that there's some autonomic influence on your um, number one pacemaker. And whatever rhythm the SA node establishes in your heart, we call that your um, normal sinus rhythm. So far, the signal has spread from SA node to AV node, so we've only managed to stimulate the atria. So the atria are stimulated first because that's where the AV nodes are located, um, the SA and the AV nodes are located. For the signal to spread down to the ventricles, it's forced through one little bundle right there. It's called the bundle of piss. Sometimes it's called the AV bundle. I still call it bundle of this, which is an older term. So the thing is, you spread the signal to the AV node, but then because you force it down a singular structure, it kind of slows down the signal. It causes a conduction delay. So there's a conduction delay a conduction delay, you observe it at the AV node. Because there's a traffic jam here at this bundle of hiss, you observe a delay in the conduction signal at the AV node just before it. Now that delay is about 100 milliseconds. And it allows time for the atria to finish contracting uh, before the ventricles can contract. Uh, yeah? Yeah, it's actually um, between them. I'll show you another picture. I'll show you an overhead view of where this bundle is. There's a tiny hole where you can see precisely where it's going down. That's coming up, okay? So now what we got is um, the signal will now spread down right the middle, right down the interventricular septum. And what's going to happen is that bundle of his will branch into two bundle branches. We have a, uh, a left bundle branch and a right bundle branch. So L and R, left and right. Bundle branches. We are in the interventricular septum. Inter <coughs> these structures you need to know that so far the only structures that have cells that have the pacemaker potential are the number one number two SAAV node. Now we're going to the apex of the heart the signal spreads all the way down there to the apex of the heart and now the signal will spread up the sides of the ventricular wall and as it does so there's all these like little Purkinje fibers that will make the heart contract as you squeeze blood out of the heart on the way up. And the Purkinje fibers are your number three pacemaker. Purkinje. Fibers. This is your bonus structure. three pacemaker, the weakest one, you really don't want to have to use these. Uh, but if you had to use them because you had a complete heart block or something, 
they could generate something like 20, 40 ash potentials per minute. So as the heart signal, it spreads up the sides of the ventricular wall. That's our system. You're going to squeeze blood out of the heart. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. The papillary muscles are going to receive their elect, um, electrical signal first. So they'll contract. So that way, when the heart starts to pump blood out, the papillary are already contracted. That'll help keep the AV valves closed. Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. So all these papillary muscles. Yeah. And um, if you can see the papillary muscle, you should look for Purkinje fibers going into it. Okay. We'll move on from this picture. So what we're going to do um, in lab on Wednesday, the ECG lab, we're going to use skin surface electrodes to take pictures of the electrical activity of the heart. So we know how the heart, the signal spreads through the heart. Okay, that's this stuff here. Um, so to get a view of it in the lab, in your subject, like taking a picture of a race car. If you were to take a picture of a race car from the front to the back or whatever, you get a different vantage point. But you're taking a picture of the same car. So, so much like, you know, a race, just taking a picture of anything, an ECG is taking a picture of the electrical activity of the heart. So instead of a camera, we have electrodes. And then so depending on how you place them clinically, you can get the classic 12 lead or 12 views of the heart. And so that, there's a 12 lead. Each of these is an electrical ECG of one view of the heart. And uh, we're not going to do a 12 lead. We're only going to do one of these 12 leads. Specifically, we're going to do uh, lead two. Okay. So I got this from a med school uh, book just to give you an overview of what, a, of what a 12 lead is. Again, we're only doing one lead, lead number two. On this graph, lead two is right here. So all, all these arrows are pointing. Basically, these six views, these six leads, are in the frontal plane. The chest leads will give you a transverse plane view, these six leads. Okay, but we're only doing this one here. So we're going to put a skin surface electrode on the wrist and on the ankle for lead two. Here's lead two. I just blew it up. So um, this is a picture from your procedures. Bam. Well, this kind of reminds me. This is we're doing the ECG lab. Um, write, write it down. That way, if you forget to print it out, they show me your notes. Now you wrote it down. Don't say you didn't know. Did anyone um, print out the, the dissection lab today? Raise your hand. Some people did. If you forgot to print it out, don't worry, I made copies for you. But how about this? Since I told you to print it out, I ain't making copies for you. Print it out, and you'll be good for Wednesday. Okay. Anyways, so in our procedure, they, they, they say put a red lead on the left leg. For us, that's our positive electrode. The white lead on the wrist here, on the right forearm. Well, that's our um, negative electrode. So what a lead is, it's, it's, you know, it's electricity. It's negative to positive. Okay? That, that's one lead, negative to positive. We'll have a, a third lead, which is a gram. Okay? That's the approximate angle. This is called Eithoven's triangle. 
and, you know, you know, we won a Nobel Prize for that in physiology. It was very important. We could kind of get a view of the cardiac cycle in electricity flow. So it's our job to kind of figure out the entire cardiac cycle by looking at that trace. Okay. That's what I'll take it through. Here's the approximate axes that the electrical signal goes through. So this lead two, where you see this classic ECG, you know, that's on the side of every ambulance, that thing. When you look at that, when you look at that, the flat line is called the isoelectric line. So what that baseline is, well, if you see any kind of deflection, that means the wave of depolarization is traveling toward the positive lead. Basically, the ash potential is spreading in the same direction as your lead. Any deflection. From the isoelectric line. Mean. Polar, the polarization, which is essentially ash potential, is traveling toward the positive lead, toward in the same direction as your lead. flat line, like, you know, the isoelectric line, that means that the polarization is traveling perpendicular to your lead. Isoelectric. <coughs> Think of it as a baseline. So if see a flat line, not, not a complete flat line, it means you're dead, but you know, any time you hear your flat line within the ECG, depolarization, depole, traveling perpendicular to your lead. Doesn't mean it's not there, it's there, you just can't see it. All right, so anyways, move on from this. We're doing lead two. So the ECG components that you got to know. We're going to go through all the components of this trace. And what I did was, um, that's actually mine that I took. And it doesn't look great. And that's by design. I, I wanted to show you a less than optimal textbook picture. So you can kind of get used to, well, OK, well, your, your subject may look better or worse. But you, but you got to know in, in, the real, in the real world. There's it's kind of noise in the background. You got to figure out the ECG components, anyways. So, in this textbook waveform, what I've highlighted is that first wave called the P wave. Then it goes Q, R, S, T. So, it's simple letters for convention to label this ECG trace. In our case, lead two. represents which part of the cardiac cycle. That's the 
question you should be asking yourself. So for example, P wave, isoelectric line, uh, P wave that first hum, it's not very big. It goes P, Q, R, S, T. Well, anyway, it's P wave. That represents atrial depolarization. Atrial depol. It will cause atrial systole. Causes atrial systole. So this is at the end of inflow, right? End of in flow. That's kind of where we are in the cardiac cycle. They, they give you the approximate time it should take. Remember, the entire cardiac cycle is about 0.8, so this is a very small portion of it. Um, well, the whole signal, it starts at the SA node, and it's spreading through the entire atrium. Starts at SA node. Your, your number one pacemaker, we already noted that. Well, anyways, what I did was I, I put the P wave and I boxed it from top to bottom from the Wigger's diagram so you could see where you are in the cardiac cycle. So hopefully you studied the cardiac cycle. Atrial systole. So it's like towards the end of inflow there. So when the signal completely spreads to the AB node, there's that little delay there. And what you can measure is what's called the PR interval. <coughs> PR interval, what, what you would do is just click and drag on your computer the P wave, but also that segment before the Q wave. The whole thing is called the PR interval, just what I have in red here. PR interval. So if you look at the picture of the heart, Yellow means depolarization spreading. And we spread through RALA, right? When you measure the PR interval, this is a representation of the conduction delay, of the delay from getting down to the ventricles. It represents a conduction delay. about 100 milliseconds. Hmm. So a conduction delay, the polarization is delayed from getting down to the ventricles. This is the time between inflow and systole, isovolumetric contraction. So, um, so the PR interval is what I just taught. Now, there's another way you could do it. Instead of measuring the P wave and this little red segment, you could just measure the little red segment, and that's called the PR segment right there. Just the segment between Q and P, that very small segment. So like, uh, just that. So this segment also represents a conduction delay. It's the same thing, just measured in a different way. Um, usually we have students measure the PR interval to measure that delay. Usually you can't see the PR segment. It's very difficult to see for students because, I mean look in mine. See how there's a little bump in the segment? This is noise. But students are like, oh, I can't see a little flat line there. I don't know what to measure. Well, just measure the whole P wave all the way up to there. So you can use the PR, PR segment to estimate a conduction delay. But usually, we tell students to avoid measuring the PR segment unless you can see it. So they both represent the delay. Well, let's think about what we're doing here. This is right before systole. 
So we want that delay there to make sure the atria finish filling the ventricles. So they, they put the PR segment right here. It's right before the first part of systole, isovolumetric contraction. Okay. All right, so um, the reason why this delay is important, if it's too delayed or completely blocked, that's called heart block or AV block or the signal is blocked from getting to the ventricles. That's the block. The signal starts in the atria. You want it to get to the ventricles. Anything that blocks it, it could show on a, it could show on the uh, ECG trace. There's different degrees. So if I show you an ECG trace from any block, one, two, or the first, second, or third, you should be able to figure out this first, second, or third uh, degree AV block. It's partial or complete. Now the first degree of heart block is simply um, the PR interval is too long. So if you compare it to the normal ECG trace at the top, you measure the PR interval, if it's too long, that means the signal's having trouble getting down to the ventricles. Long PR interval greater than 0.2 seconds. Should be about 0.1, but it's about greater than 0.2, that's considered first degree heart block. Probably not a clinical problem. The signal has no problem getting down there. You probably have enough cardiac output <clears throat> to keep your blood pressure up. That's not what we're talking about here. I mean, as long as the ventricles can contract enough to keep cardiac output enough to keep blood pressure up, well, you usually don't worry about it too much. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go see the doctor. Now, second degree block, it's a little bit more serious. What you have is progressively longer longer PR intervals than you skip a heartbeat. There's a complete failure of the AV node. Progressively longer PR intervals than no R wave. You basically skip a heartbeat. Okay. Heart skips a beat. A uh, third degree block is a complete block. Second degree is a partial block. The signal gets through sometimes and maybe skips every once in a while. But the third degree heart block, the signal's not getting through at all. Third degree heart block is a complete block. For whatever reason, the um, signal ain't getting through. Maybe drugs or trauma can cause it. Well, anyways, look at the ECG. What you see are random P's, random R's. The pacemakers in the atria are working independent of the number three pacemaker, the Purkinje fibers operating independent in the ventricles. So there's just random P's, random R's. There's no association with those waves. It doesn't, doesn't look good. You can just look at it. It doesn't look good at all. The R waves are kind of weak because the Purkinje fibers aren't good pacemakers. All right, so that's heart block. Now, if you have no problem with no blocks and the signal can travel down the septum, that's what you see here. So the atria have depolarized and they're repolarizing. That's the red color, repolarized. As the signal travels down the bundle of hiss, and the bundle branches, you're inside the interventricular septum and you travel to the apex of the heart. And that shows up as the Q wave.
here's our ECGP segment. Ooh, deflection down is our Q wave. That's Q. And then the rest of it. So, Q wave. Okay, so this represents the depolarization, depol for short. It's spreading down, it's traveling down. Oops. <coughs> traveling down. Fondilla pits. left and right bundle branches to the apex of the heart. Okay, this is just prior to systole. So I wanted to show you this picture. Compare um, the four valves. The valves have this fiber skeleton that supports them. These rings. <coughs> okay. And someone asked about the bundle of hiss. See that little hole? That's for the, that's for the bundle of hiss. You should be able to identify that hole because you're supposed to know the bundle of hiss. Okay. So don't don't let that little hole escape you. Um, well, anyways, that's kind of where the bundle of his is. It's kind of in between all of those uh, heart valves. Yeah. That's how the signal is spreading down. So this is very important to know. When the signal spreads from the atria to the ventricles, it goes down the septum first. Right? Something I've noticed after many years of staring at this picture, but I've never asked myself this question. Well, if the signal spreads all the way down the atria, how come it doesn't spread straight down to the ventricles? Why does it only go down that singular bundle of this? And this picture helps, answers the question for us, because these fibrous rings, the um, connective tissue doesn't conduct the signal. Uh, so you force it down that singular hole. Okay. And that's great because Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Go back to this picture here. If you stimulate only the septum in the middle, can you squeeze the ventricles? No, you can't. You're only stimulating the middle. There's no squeezing on the sides. So you force it down to the apex, so as the signal spreads up the sides of the wall, you squeeze from the bottom up. That makes for a very efficient ejection of blood from the heart, right? Like for example, if you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, like I do, from the top, what happens to the toothpaste in the bottom? It never gets out unless you go from the bottom, you squeeze up. And so that's why the heart's very efficient at pumping blood. You squeeze from the bottom up. And so uh, as the signal spreads through the up sides of the ventricular wall, it shows as the QRS complex. QRS complex, it represents <coughs> ventricular depolarization. Again, we're still just before systole. just before systole, but the depolarization causes systole. Okay. 
based on the waveform, your QRS complex is a sharp spike. It's very short. This tells you that the Purkinje fibers that cause this, it makes the heart muscle contract hard and fast. You know, it's not a, it's not a lazy hill. It's a sharp spike. Okay, so waveform kind of tells you something about the speed of conduction there. It makes those ventricles conduct very fast. So they put the QRS complex, it's basically right on top of uh, isovolumetric contraction. This is when you're going to start building tension in the heart muscle for the ventricles there. Okay, so this is basically causing systole. And so um, when the ventricles are in full on systole, we see it as the ST signal, that flat line right there. So this is the time of the cardiac cycle during the peak systole. Um, remember I asked you on the, that worksheet, like what was the peak systole? And I had to put a number to it. The answer was 120 millimeters of mercury. Remember putting that? Well, anyway, that's what we're talking about here. This is when the heart is generating the peak pressure to eject blood from the heart. Let me draw it like I have been, sorry. I forgot to do that. So it goes P, Q, R, and then when you get back to the isoelectric line, the ST segment is boop, right there. Then it goes T. Okay. S, T, So that's what I have highlighted on my ECG, right? That segment right before the T-wave. So um, there, there it is, boxed there. So peak systole is right here. This is when you're pushing out most of the blood. So if you're having a heart attack, this might be something to look at. There could be an abnormality in the ST segment. Um, if you have ST segment depression, in other words, below the line, that could mean there's some ischemia going on. Ischemia is a lack of blood flow, but it's not quite a heart attack. It could lead to a heart attack. One could be happening very soon after. But the lack of blood flow will cause tremendous discomfort, maybe some chest pains. If you're actually having a heart attack, um, that's called ST segment elevation. Elevation is injury. We call it acute myocardial infarction. Acute MI. Heart attack. When you say acute MI in clinical circles, and well. Um, for the 12 lead, what lead are we doing? Two. Do you see two on here? This is a real printout. Student gave me as a paramedic. It was like, uh, right here. There's lead two. So I point to the ST segment elevation. I'm sure that person was diagnosed with some kind of acute myocardial injury. I mean, there is no segment. It just runs right to the T-wave. Um, Q, the QT interval would represent the entire ventricular systole, not just the peak. 
that's kind of what you highlight there. So when you highlight it in the lab, we're going to highlight everything starting from Q, R, S, and all the T. That represents QT interval. Represents entire system. So th there it is. I just put a box around it, and uh, well, it's the entire big, includes everything the complete contraction, the peak, and then the complete relaxation. Okay. Represents the entire contraction of both the ventricles. So, we should, um, what you should know in Wednesday's lab, not only do I want you to print it out, when you work in groups, um, one person's going to exercise. For a brief period of time, so I want someone to come and dress to exercise. And um, your heart rate's going to get up. What you should see from this is when you exercise, your heart beats obviously faster, but harder. Harder and faster. And so that makes the QT interval shrink okay, compared to rest because you're trying to increase the cardiac output to meet the metabolic demand of your workout. Right. So we should know that it is a decreases, QT interval decreases with increasing heart rate. Now let's stop here and take our break. That way you'll have plenty of time to do the dissection. Come back at 12.15. We'll get started.